This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of Psalms. Psalms, beginning with Psalm 135, going through Psalm 141. God's loving kindness. Oh, God loves us, doesn't he? We're going to look in Psalm 135 about God's greatness, then his mercy in Psalm 136. We'll look at God's home, God's goodness, God's greatness, God's deliverance, God's preservation, loving kindness. And the word loving kindness from the Hebrew is a wonderful word because it means more than just I love you. Ever been to a wedding? We all have been involved with a wedding. Many of us have. We, there's a lot of love. I've never been in a wedding where there was not love expressed between the man and the woman. But how long does it last? And what's it based on? It should be based on a contract, shouldn't it? The contract, the marriage covenant uh, with the two parties and with God. But as a matter of fact, feelings get involved and I don't in any way criticize, but marriages don't always last. Well, the good news about the word loving kindness, and it's an interesting word in the Hebrew, the word is chesed. You got to get it down in your throat and bring it up. H-E-S-E-D, chesed. It's a love that's based on a contract, a contract that God has, a covenant that God has with us. The Old Testament covenant of Moses, the New Testament covenant of love in Jesus Christ. So God is going to love you so long as he honors his contract, his contract with his son and with his bride. If the father stops loving Jesus, we're in trouble. But so long as God loves Jesus and Jesus loves us, that love is guaranteed. No divorce. You won't lose your salvation. You will not be divorced. God loves us. It's forever and ever. That's great news. That's worth just going out and having some coffee right now. Who's going to buy at McDonald's? We've had a message there, I think, that'll last us all week long. Or we could go on and do Psalm 135. What do you say we try that? All right, here's a call to praise. And here's the cause for praise. Praise the Lord. What's the Hebrew word for that? Hallelujah. The same word in every language in the world. Praise the Lord. It's the only language... Uh, common to all is that language of the word hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. And incidentally, speaking of hallelujah, you remember what happened at the Tower of Babel when man became proud, according to Genesis? God confounded their languages so they couldn't communicate and try to become like God. And so from that moment on, we had all these different languages and there was no real understanding among people without learning the language. Interesting that God confounded the languages to deal with pride, but the antidote for pride is to bring all those languages together in that one phrase, praise the Lord. So pride causes us to scatter with multitude of languages, but humility and worshiping God brings us all together with one phrase that you can take anywhere around the world and they'll understand what you're saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Remember that. Maybe you're not going through good times, but the Lord is good. His plan for you is good. Sing praises to his name, for it's pleasant. My wife likes to send me texts and videos of different worship groups, and right now she sent me one this morning, and, and it was just pleasant to be able to hear that. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Talked about Job going through troubles, having his uh, children killed, and his servants and his animals taken, and yet he blessed the name of the Lord, because God is good. He's always deserving of it. So we sing praises, and as we do, it's pleasant. Pleasant to God, pleasant to us. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. And we're supposed to be applying the scripture to us. Yes, Israel is his special treasure, but so am I, and so are you. A special treasure. My brother had a friend who was adopted. He went on to become a Catholic priest, a good fellow. I saw him not so long ago. We had to co-officiate a funeral. But uh, Father John, who was just then John, just a... 
high school kid, four years behind me, was adopted by his parents. And he would go to school and the other kids would make fun of him and say, you're adopted. But even from the earliest stage, he learned to say, guess what? I was chosen. Your parents had no choice with you. And so he learned that and he meant that and he was the most secure young fellow. His parents adored him. He was as Anglo-Saxon as could be and his parents were as Italian as can be. He didn't look anything like them and he just glowed with a sheen. I never saw such a person feel such love. He was the most loved child. I was chosen. You had no choice. Your parents had no choice. So God has chosen me. He has chosen you. What a wonderful treasure for us. For I know that the Lord is great. Verse 5, how big is your God? Your God can become bigger than you think he is. You can't increase the size of God, but you can increase your knowledge of God and your faith in God. And my guess is my God is not as great as he wants to be in my life or as great as he will be if I have faith and get into his word and see what he can do. And our Lord is above all gods, the gods of our own making, the addictions, the preferences that we have. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. We know that's true, right? In heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all deep places, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. God can take care of my needs, no matter what they are. I don't care what your problem is, he has a solution for it. I don't care how much desert you have, he can make a stream in the desert anytime he wants. Verse 8, he destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings. Remember how the Israelites were going through the wilderness and they were coming over uh, on the eastern side of the Jordan and all these different kings were fighting them. Then they had to get into the land itself, cross over that Jordan River again, and they had to uh, face those kings. Well, God gave them victory over every one. Sihon, verse 11, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, all the kingdoms of Canaan, he gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel and his people. Oh, there were giants in those lands. But they had faith. None had any more faith than Joshua and Caleb. Caleb was 80 years old. And when it came time for him to choose his land, he chose the roughest, hilliest, difficult, treacherous land with the biggest, most ornery, ugly giants you could possibly imagine. He had that kind of faith, and he chose that land for his people. People of great faith. Verse 15, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. So think about the idols of today, the idols of our own making. Maybe you don't have a statue in your house, but... Maybe there's something or someone sitting on the throne of your heart. An idol is anything or anyone that supplants God in our hearts. The easiest way to find out about an idol is this. Is my prayer life what it should be? Is my Bible study life what it should be? Am I serving the way I should be? Or is something or someone blocking it? If someone or something is blocking it, bingo, there's my idol. What do you have to do? What did Gideon have to do when God called him? He had to tear down his father's idol of Baal. Tear it down. Stop it. Get out of my life. Whatever that idol is, I'm going to replace you. Don't just take the idol down. Replace the idol. I call that replacement theology. Take the idol down and put the Lord in its place. The time that I devote to that thing or that one that's not of God, I need to now put God in its place. So that's getting rid of idolatry. Verse 19, bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the house, the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. And what does the word blessing really mean? Here it is, praise the Lord. Psalm 136 talks about God's mercy. He is, here's the call to praise and here's the cause for our praise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, 
for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. Notice that repetition of that phrase, his mercy endures forever. Repetition is good, as long as it's meaningful. No harm in repetition. Jesus didn't say that repetition was bad, but just a vain or empty repetition. So make sure that when you're repeating something, that it's meaningful. To him who alone does great wonders, his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. You get the idea of the theme here? And notice how we go from uh, the great to the small. God creates the heavens, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and then there's my little problem. Do you think he can handle it? If he can handle all of that, do you think there's a chance he might have a solution to my problem? Amen. Verse 10, to him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, brought out Israel from among them, his mercy endures forever, with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, his mercy endures forever. He overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, his mercy endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his mercy endures forever. Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. It gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his mercy endures forever. Who remembered us in our lowly states. He gets right down to me now. From all that great work with creating the nature, heavens, the earth, then to the kings and the armies, right down to where I live. He rescued us from our enemies, verse 24, his mercy endures forever. He gives food to all flesh, his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. So, for extra credit, go home today and about 150 million times say, for his mercy endures forever. Watch what it does to your spirit. One of my dear friends and the friend of this ministry was the late Reverend Don Gossett. Don used to be on the radio program uh, here in this area for many, many years. And he always ended his program by a repetition. What did he always say? Praise the Lord 10 times. And he would get his hand out and he'd say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He would do it 10 times. And I loved it, and it just refreshed my spirit. Once I was vacationing on the island of St. Martin, and I was talking to a man who listened to the radio broadcast down there. And uh, I remember Jack. Jack was a nice guy, but Jack had a little attitude. And he resented Don saying, you have to praise the Lord 10 times. And I said, well, Jack, you don't need to praise the Lord 10 times. Praise him 11 times. Or nine times, who cares? But praise the Lord. So then Jack kind of softened up a little bit and realized, yeah, let's get the attitude out of there. I get the attitude as well, don't you, at times? Don't always feel like praising the Lord. But I'll tell you something, you start saying, his mercy endures forever six or seven times, praise the Lord six, seven, eight times, pray in tongues, pray in English. After the first couple of minutes, you begin to get into the flow, the old nature lays down and the new nature takes over. And so repetition is good as long as it's meaningful and our minds are on the Lord. Psalm 137, let's talk about God's home. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Remember how they rebelled against God? Remember the idolatry problem? The idolatry of the Canaanites became the idolatry of the Israelites. God said, if you don't turn from your idolatry, I will cast you out of the land just as I did Canaan. Did they listen? Nope, they worshiped the same idols. And don't you know God had to cast them out? And in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army burned the whole city and took them into captivity. And there they were, plucked down 
in Babylon, remembering their home that they were taken from. And so by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion or Jerusalem. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for, the, for, these, uh, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. So they were despondent. They were depressed because they were far from their home. When you're depressed and somebody says to you, just praise the Lord, you don't feel like it, do you? You have to be careful when you go to a funeral and uh, there is the person that's been left behind, the spouse, the kids or what have you. You walk right up and say, slap them on the back. Come on, praise the Lord. You know they love Jesus. They're with the Lord. Knock off the attitude here. And that doesn't always go so well, does it? You need to be kind of gentle and careful and quiet. Maybe just sometimes say nothing and just come alongside and put your arm around that person or hold their hand for a moment and say nothing at all. But they were depressed. They remembered Zion and here they were in captivity. Verse 4, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. Jacob was related to Esau. They were brothers, weren't they? From Jacob came Israel. From Esau came Edom. Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came in, as I said, and began to destroy Jerusalem. And what did their brothers do to the south? West, southeast, what did Edom do? They cheered Babylon on, raise it, burn it to the ground. Sometimes when you're being taken to the woodshed or some destruction's coming upon your life, those that you think are your family, sometimes they're not with you. Sometimes they're glad to see you go down. Well, that's the way it was here. Lord, remember how they were against us. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. So we're sad. We're sad that we're taken out of the land. So the only solution to that depression is to get back into the land by praising the Lord. Amen. Because the real home was not in Jerusalem. The real home was in the heart. It's not a building. It's not a location. It's a heart relationship with Jesus. If I feel as though my home is abandoned, that I'm far from home, I need to praise the Lord. I need to turn to Him and let the home of God be right within me. You are the temple of God, the Apostle Paul said. Psalm 138, God's goodness. Here's a psalm of David. Oh, I love his psalms. So born out of real life experiences. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Isn't that amazing? He magnifies his word above his name. Elsewhere, he said his word is more important than his name. You can go to the bank on God's word in the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. So when there's pride, God is far off. When you're humble, he will draw near. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. Isn't that amazing? David had a lot of problems, had a lot of enemies. King Saul, to whom he ministered music and worship, tried to kill him. The Philistines tried to kill him. Ammonites, Moabites, Edomites, all the ites were against him. But you know, he just trusted in the Lord. He'd been down, but God lifted him up. I walk in the midst of trouble. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. 
<laughs> That's one of those promises I never get up and claim. Now, Lord, you promised me tribulation. Bring it on. No, I never claim that. It'll, it'll find you. Just get up in the morning and it'll be there. But you're going to revive me. So don't concentrate on the trouble. Look at the revival. Revive us again, O Lord. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Not me, but you, Lord. I'm not going to go against my enemies. I'm not going to try to bring them down. That's your job. Vengeance is yours. You'll take care of it. Your right hand, on the other hand, is going to save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me, or he'll complete it. I like that. The Lord will perfect or complete that which concerns me. Paul said to the Philippian church, He who began a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. He's not finished with you yet. Oh, I drive home at night. I don't care which way I go. 85 or down on 787, heading home. There's construction. The lights are on. The guys are out working. Got to go into one lane. And um, it's a bit of a pain sometimes. Doesn't look the way you'd like it to, but they're under construction. It won't be like that forever. Seems like it at times, but not. They're under construction. I'm under construction. So are you. It looks as though God has drop the building plans. He hasn't. He will complete or perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. David did not give up. He did not lose heart. You and I must not give up. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. Psalm 139, God's greatness. God's goodness, rather. Praise the Lord. He's our deliverer. And again, another psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. This is perhaps my favorite psalm, and I hate to go too fast through this, but I want to go back and look at the first couple of verses. Lord, you've searched me and you've known me. Mothers, fathers, do you know your kids? Does your mother know you better than anybody else? Or if she's no longer here, did she know you better? Nobody knew you like your mother. Nobody knows us like God. You've searched me and you've known me. God's searching constantly. Elsewhere, the Bible says his thoughts are as numberless as the grains of sand by the seashore concerning us. He thinks about us constantly. You've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. That's why you don't need to spend a lot of time in prayer now. Lord, let me fill you in on what the problem is. Save your breath. Praise the Lord instead. He knows the problem. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. Oh, he knows us better than we know ourselves. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before. You've enclosed me, and you've laid your hand upon me. Talk about protection. He puts a hedge in front of you. He puts a hedge behind you, and he puts his hand over you. Totally and completely protects. Again, look at that mother with a child. Right now, we have a little mother in our home with a child born last September, on the most important day of the year, my birthday. September 15, beautiful little grandchild, little Lily. And mother and grandmother are just all over that child, protecting her, making sure that she's fine and well and everything is attended to. And all that loving care reminds us of God. He's got a hedge in front of us, a hedge behind us, and he's got his hand over us. Sometimes I feel like God has let the hedge out too far. How about you? Sometimes I feel like maybe somebody like the devil mowed the hedge down and and I'm kind of exposed behind. Not true. I'm sure Job felt that way. When everything that he had 
was destroyed except for his wife who said, why don't you curse God and die? But God had a plan. God was still protecting him. And in the end, he ended up with twice as much as he ever had before. And oh, I was so concerned about that, that he had more kids than before. I said, but Lord, the, the earlier kids were destroyed. And the Lord said, where were the kids? Where are the kids? The first kids that were killed, where are they? I said, well, they're alive, they're in heaven. So he said, what's the problem? So God's hedge is there. And if it seems like he's moved the hedge out too far or mowed the hedge down, that's not true. Oh, he'll allow the devil to come in and rattle our cage. Otherwise, he'll never get any prayer time from us or praise time. It keeps us close on a short leash, but that hedge is there. And I'll tell you, he will not allow that enemy to go any further than for our good and for his glory. So you just praise the Lord. Thank God for that hedge before, behind, and your hand all over me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. We have no way to think about or express the protection and the love that God has for us. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? The Holy Spirit is everywhere. I can't get away from your spirit. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. I can't escape you. I wouldn't want to anyway. And this passage here about where would I go into heaven or into hell, that's picked up by the Apostle Paul, where in Romans he talks about the fact that you don't need to search to find salvation. You don't need to go to heaven to try to find salvation or down into hell. Don't need to travel across the world to find it. He said salvation's near you even in your mouth. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. The miracle of a child. The miracle of a baby. My stepfather, Pastor Mort, born and raised as an Orthodox Jew, soon left Judaism and moved quickly into atheism. Married a Jewish lady. And when the first child came out of that woman's womb, my father, Mort, looked at that baby and he said, this could not just happen. There has to be a God. The birth of a child formed in the mother's womb spoke to him of a God. He then searched for that God and by the grace of God found God and God was searching for him. He became a born again believer and served the Lord faithfully as a pastor in this church until the last days of his life. But it was the beautiful birth of a child, the forming of the inward parts, the covering in the womb that spoke to him. I'll praise you, Lord. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. We take birth of children for granted, but unfortunately some children are not born perfectly. We still love them and do all we can to help them, but some are born infirmed and some die in the womb. And some are aborted. And while that's a tragedy, at least we have the consolation that those children are with the Lord for eternity. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How long will I live? I don't know. But there are a certain number of days assigned for my life 
And those days were written down in God's book before I was even born. Now I need to do all I can to take care of myself. I spend too much time at McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts and I probably shouldn't be doing that. But still, with proper care and maintenance, we should live out the number of years that God has allotted to us. And those days are all fashioned by Him. So the important thing for us is not how many days do I have. That's God's business. But how will I spend my days? That's my business. Will I spend my days praising you, Lord, serving you, Lord? That's my goal. Verse 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. We talked about this before. Here it is. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. He's thinking about us all the time. And loving us. When I first met and started courting my wife, I thought about her all the time. As month followed month, I can't say year followed year because we're coming up on our second anniversary here, but every day since I met her, I think about her all the time. All my thoughts are towards her and about her. 99% of them are good. Once in a while, I want to kick the desk about something and I get a text that gets me a little ticked off, but I'm thinking about her all the time and loving her. And how much more does God love us and care for us? And so he thinks about us more than the grains of sand by the seashore. And when you awake, he's still there. He's still there. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. And my favorite psalm, Psalm 139, and now my favorite verses, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You pray that prayer every day, you'll be just fine. I think I'm doing well, but search me, Lord. I think my motives are pure, but search me, O Lord. I think I'm surrendered to you, but search me, O Lord. Check me out. You go to the doctor's office, and it's a routine visit. It's an annual visit. You think you're doing well, but what are you saying? Search me. Run your tests. Do your blood work. Take your x-rays. Make sure everything is just fine. Well, you do that maybe annually or every three months or six months. Do this with God every day. He's the ultimate physician. Search me, O Lord. Anything wrong that I need to take care of, deal with it. If there's any wicked way, then lead me in the way everlasting. Great psalm. Psalm 140, another psalm of David talking about God's deliverance, and oh, he knew about that. Lord, deliver me and handle my enemies. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. He had a lot of enemies, didn't he? We all have enemies. Let the Lord handle it. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men. Again, don't take the matters into your own hands. Let God preserve you. Let God keep you. Those who have purposed to make my steps stumble, the proud have hidden a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord, O God the Lord, the strength of my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Verse 6 is important. As the enemy is pressing in around us, fear grips our hearts. We need to turn that fear into faith. And the fastest way to do it is found in verse 6. Turn to the Lord and say, 
You are my God. Get your eyes off the problem. Get your eyes off the enemy. Get your eyes off yourself and off your own resources. Get them onto God. You are my God. And hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. And supplication means to write from the bowels of your innermost being, Lord, help me. Cry it out to him. O God, the Lord, you have the strength of my salvation. You've covered my head in the day of battle. So you've sheltered me. Arrows are flying all over the place. In those days, that was one of the major weapons of use, bows and arrows. Cover your head so you don't get an arrow stuck at the top of your head. Very uncomfortable. Lord, cover my head. The fiery darts of the enemy are coming at me all the time. And you know, it's not just people who are speaking against you. We've got enough evil thoughts in our old nature to drive us down. We manufacture many of the evil thoughts that, that come our way, just our own thinking, fear. People have said that 90 plus percent of the things you fear never come about. Well, where did they come from? Our own thinking in most cases. Or somebody gave us a thought that we manufactured and began to develop it, and the next thing you know, we're in panic and it never happens. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Verse 9, as for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Oh, I love those Psalms. I love those verses. When somebody does me harm, I want to say the same thing. Lord, let burning coals fall upon them, cast them into the fire. I could add a few more things, like let's poke out their eyes and let's just do all sorts of things here. It comes so naturally, doesn't it? And then Jesus comes and he spoils the party and he says, no, now because of grace we have to pray for them, do good for them, love them who despitefully use you. Ugh. That's why I love the Old Testament. The theologians have a great term for this. These are the imprecatory psalms. There's a $5 word for you, Tyrell. Imprecatory, invoking the wrath and the vengeance of God. Comes so naturally. But David didn't have the grace of Jesus. He wasn't in the New Testament time. So we do have to go and pray for our enemies and love them and do good to those who spitefully use us. But Lord, while I'm doing that, if some coals of fire do happen to fall on their head, well, that's your business. I didn't tell you to do it, but uh, verse 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Psalm 141, again, we end with David. A prayer for safekeeping out of wickedness. God's going to preserve us. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Do you remember in that little tabernacle and later on in the temple, they would offer incense 9 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon? That incense was going up before the throne of God. And that incense, that sweet-smelling savor, spoke really of the prayers of the people of Israel. And that idea of incense is also in the New Testament. And here we find that there the prayers are also being offered up before God. Verse 8 talking about the Lamb of God, the living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Did you offer a prayer to the Lord today? We offered prayers. Pastor Kelly offered prayers on our behalf. Those are in heaven right now, in golden bowls, as incense, before the throne of God, incense before the Lamb of God. So this incense is the prayers of the saints. How wonderful that we can understand that and participate in it. Verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Oh, there's a good prayer. Oh, yeah. 
Did I ever say anything that I wish I hadn't said? Hmm, yeah, what time is it? <laughs> yeah, you bet. Oh, Lord, set a guard on my mouth. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness, and let him rebuke me, it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. Words I never like to hear. Jerry, could I make a suggestion? Mm, of course you can. Yeah, what is it? And all the defenses come up. Whatever you're going to suggest that I'm doing wrong, I, I have an answer for it. And I need to re rebuff that, and I need to rebuke it, and I need to defend myself. That goes on in a millisecond. But, it, but that never shows. Sure, what is it on your heart? And then you get a suggestion for change. And the natural reaction is, I've been doing it this way for many years, in some cases longer than you've been alive, and you think I should change it? No, we need to be open. If the rebuke comes from the enemy, shut it down. But if it comes from the righteous, open up. Look at verse 5. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness. When a righteous person comes, in the name of the Lord, with a righteous rebuke, take the strike. It's from God. It shall be a kindness, and let him rebuke me. It shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. Lord, help me to take suggestions. I don't know it all. I want God to have you and you alone speak to me and nobody else. That's right, that's wrong. God's going to speak to me directly in some cases, but sometimes he'll speak through you and through others. Jerry, you need to make a correction here. Or you need to pray about this. And you might not like the suggestion. You might think it's wrong. Probably do, because you've done it a different way. But at least I'll pray about it. I'll take it before the Lord, see what he has to say, and give it to God. And then when you do that, you're in good shape. Verse 6, their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff, talking about the wicked. They hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave as one plows and breaks up the earth. But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. My eyes are on you, O Lord. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape safely. Wonderful, wonderful psalms. Our theme, God's loving kindness, his greatness, his mercy, his goodness, his deliverance, his preservation. Do you know the Lord? I'm talking now especially to those by YouTube or television. Do you know the Lord? Do you want his protection? You're listening to this program for some reason, and you've gone through most all of it, I imagine. God bless you for that. And... I'd like to give you a chance to give your heart to the Lord. I thank God for these wonderful days of the video and the YouTubes and, and uh, internet. People all over the world are able to watch these programs. And so I want to give you the chance to bow your heart before the Lord and receive Him and receive His loving kindness. He loves you. I made a reference earlier to Paul talking to the Romans about salvation. You don't need to go to heaven, don't need to come to Albany, New York, don't need to go to hell. You need to, in your mouth, find the words that Jesus is Lord. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Believe that God has raised him from the dead to approve the fact that he died for your sins and that he is giving you his righteousness. Do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Can you call upon him now as your Lord and your Savior? I'll lead you in a brief prayer. Wherever you are, bow your heart and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner and I repent of my sins. Lord Jesus, I believe that you were raised again for my righteousness. Thank you for bearing my sins. Come into my heart. Live your life in me and I will live for you and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, 
for your salvation, your loving kindness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.